Spirit, my heart is your home. The doors are open, blow through every room. I want to hear your voice. I want to feel you move. Okay, so tonight we are talking Holy about Spirit, creation, uh, specifically how the church addressed the story of creation. And I want to also mention how, um, unfortunately, it's met in our culture today with skepticism and mostly with misunderstanding. And I, I was saying to someone uh, last week or the week before, I can't remember, if I hand you a Bible and you've never seen the Bible before, your inclination, if you were going to read it, your inclination might be open the front cover, start in the first page, and read it like you would read a book. Well, that makes about as much sense sometimes as maybe going to a library and saying, if I read the first book here and work my way to the back, it'll all make sense to me. It doesn't. This is not a book. This is a library. So we have to know that, that books in the library are written by different authors at different times in different languages for different reasons, for different purposes, in different genres. That's exactly what the Bible is. Now, as it turns out, when we go to the first book of the Bible, Genesis, in the first chapter, Genesis 1, we see this a story which is in the genre of myth. Myth is, you know, it's a, that's a loaded word. People think, oh, it's a myth. Well, that's, a, that's the style of writing that it is. It does not mean at all that what's in there is not truth. And that's what we have to sort of separate. Now, one great example. Now, I, this hardcover one I have here of the NAB is exactly the same writing, even the same font as the one you have. But it seems that I have this picture in mind that you don't have in the red one. And what this is, is oh, it's, it's kind of kind of funny, actually. It's the Jewish view of what the world and creation look like. So there's the heavenly seat of the divinity up here. There's this big dome of water where the rain comes from. Below that, there's, these, there's a, a, a sphere with floodgates to let the water through. Then the stars and the moon are all stuck to the top of that. And then there's the firmament in the sky and then these columns that hold up the earth. Not scientific at all. So there are people who will say, maybe not about this in particular, but if the Bible says it in a certain way, I have to make a choice. I have to choose between the way scripture says it or the way my science teacher told me in, you know, sixth grade or whatever. And it, it can't be both. And that is absolutely false because the Bible is not trying to be a science book. It's, it's not, it, it, well, I should say Genesis is not trying to be a science book or better yet, Genesis has 50 chapters. And if you were to read all the way through to chapter 12, you would notice something changes. The style changes completely. It becomes a historical account of Abraham leaving the land of Ur and the Chaldees and how the Jewish people came to the Holy Land. It becomes very historical. The style of writing is totally different. Why is that? Because Genesis wasn't written until it had been uh, passed on as oral tradition for thousands of years. Then it finally got written down. And also, as it turns out, let me ask this question. What is more reliable, written tradition or oral tradition? Anybody? Oral. Oral tradition is more reliable. And we, we tend to make that mistake. We think written tradition is more reliable. Written tradition is passed almost through a funnel through few people, very few people, who have the ability to, to be scribes or, 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 or uh, translators or whatever it might be. And that's where mistakes are made and then propagated to a wider audience. When we think of oral tradition, we make the mistake of thinking um, like the telephone game. Like if I whisper something, remember that? If I whisper something to you and then you whisper it all along, the last person is going to have a totally different story than what I said. But that's not how oral tradition works. Oral tradition is a self-correcting mechanism. So the, and the best tradition is the mass. All right, the best example is the mass. So if I go to the mass, I've been trained in, in, in how to serve in the mass and the priests have all been trained on how to celebrate the mass. If I make a mistake, I will be immediately corrected. If I see someone else make they'll be corrected. So, so much so that if I fly to the other side of the, of the planet and I go to mass, it's the same thing. And it's been doing, we've been doing that for almost 2,000 years. Now, the changes that have happened have been changes that have been uh, purposely introduced to the mass. So if it looks different now than it did 500 years ago, and it does, it's because those changes were purposely introduced and then propagated through the oral tradition by doing it over and over again. Same thing we see in, in societies where uh, they want to get... Uh, uh, like, like, like ethnographies, you go, to, you go to some primitive society where they don't really have a written tradition and say, well, how do you know about your, your story? Well, we tell stories all the time. That's part of knowing who we are. 
and it's, it's a self-correcting mechanism, and it's extremely precise. They can usually go back and tell you their ancestors going way, way, way back. That oral tradition kept going on and on and on among the Jewish people until finally someone wrote it down. Because when you think about it, Adam and Eve are our progenitors here in the, in the Bible. If it was just Adam and Eve, who was holding the pen? There was no one there to write it down. So this had to be part of the tradition as time went on, and, and it was. Going back to this picture, now we know now this is not what the earth looks like. There are no gates up in the sky that open up to let the rain come through. That's not how it works. We all have science, we know how that works. So is this wrong? Well, it depends. How are we looking at it? Are we looking at it scientifically? Yes, it's wrong. Are we looking at it as a sense of what is the sto what is this story trying to tell me? And the story is trying to tell me that I have a relationship with the Creator, that I am not here by, by accident or by mistake, none of us are, that we're put here with a purpose, and I have a certain relationship with God, a relationship that has that was was broken. That, that needs to be repaired and needs to be maintained, and I am different than the animals and the plants and the rocks and the trees and the mountains. And that's, that's the truth. That is what's true in here. And that's what the author of Genesis, or at least, again, the first 11 chapters, is trying to get through to us. Not that this is exactly how the earth was made. So there's two stories of creation in Genesis. And you might be familiar with, with both to, to a degree. You know, uh, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And then that was the first day. Let there be a dome in the middle of the waters, like I just explained, to separate one body of, uh, of water from the other. And so it happened. He made the dome. Evening came. Morning followed. The second day. And in seven days, God creates all of creation. Now, seven days is whatever, 24 hours times seven. Is that really how long it took? It doesn't matter that the author doesn't care about that. The people, when, whenever we read scripture, one of the things we have to always keep in mind is, what did the audience of this read, what did they care about? And then we'll know how the author was trying to get to them. Did they care about science? Science, as we, as we really care about it, is really, maybe the 1700s, it really became a thing. Now, we've been learning forever, but it really became a discipline we focused on in the Enlightenment period. Okay, which was just a couple hundred years ago. And we have hyper-focused on science and scientific realism and scientific accuracy since then. And to our benefit, we should be doing that. The church has actually been the largest promoter of that. Not someone who says we can't believe science, but we must embrace science because knowing the creation helps us know the creator. And that that's exactly the church's position on that. So when we read this, we can't say, well, I can't, you know, I get to, maybe I'll make it to chapter 11. I go, forget this. I can't read this thing. This whole book is probably going to be just like that. And I can't read this Bible thing because it's just, it's, it's craziness. There's talking animals. There's all, all, all sorts of things going on here. Well, just like you'd watch a movie that you know is fiction, there might be truth in there. This is not fiction in the sense that that uh, it's not true. There are embedded truths in here. And the most important thing we take away from Genesis is we have a real relationship with God, the God who created us, and, and we are different from the rest of creation. So knowing that, let's, uh, um, one of the ways we're different is that we are made, as, as scripture tells us, we are made in the image and likeness of God. Nothing else is. Now, I don't look like you, and you don't look like him, and he doesn't look like her. So which one is it? Which of us is made in the image and likeness of God? Why does it say that? What is, which one of us does God look like? Well, God is non-corporeal, okay? He does not have a body. God is not male or female. We call him him because he has revealed himself to us as a father. So that's why we call him him. But God, God has no, except Jesus Christ, God does not have a corporeal body. But he's made us in his image in that we share in his divinity. We have, when we were created, at the moment of our creation, we're given a soul. And the soul is a portion of God's divinity. He didn't give that to any of his other creations. And because of that, we sort of have dominion over all of the rest of creation. So among the things he gave us, was a superior intellect that we have over, over the rest of creation, but he also gave us free will. Now, if I tell you, you know, I have this dog and I chain him in the wall and that dog never runs away. Well, yeah, you got him chained to a wall. But if I take him off the chain 
and he still stays, now I know it's his choice. If he runs away, he's chosen to leave me and, and go, well, I'm not saying we're dogs, but God has given us free will to say, I am not chaining you. I am not a puppet master. You have free will. I want you to love me. That's what God is saying. I want you to love me. And the way I know you will is by not forcing you to, by giving you the option to not love me. So we have this story in creation where there is the serpent. and the, you know, one of the, We have two stories in creation. One is the first day, second day, third day story. The next one is where God creates it. And he makes man out of clay. And there's this Garden of Eden. And right in the center of the garden is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we always say it's an apple, but they didn't have apples that part of the world. It's a fruit of some kind. And you can eat anything you want. You can do whatever you want in here, but you can't have fruit from that tree. Well, what becomes the most tempting thing? It's, 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 and by the way, this tree isn't off to the side. It's not way in the back. It's right there where they see it all the time. It's a temptation for them to say, if you choose me, then you will choose the creator over the creation. So did this actually happen? I don't know, I wasn't there, but I really would, it doesn't matter if this actual thing happened. But what did happen was that God created our first ancestors, gave them free will. We are all descendants of those original ancestors, gave them free will and said, I want you to choose me. And what did they do? They chose something else. They chose the creation. And that's called the fall. So they were tempted. And the, and the serpent says, um, well, God says to him, if you eat of this, of this uh, fruit of the, of, the, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And the serpent says, you're not going to die. Go ahead, eat it. So they eat the fruit, and they go, hey, we're not dead. But it says, but their eyes were opened. So did God lie? Because they, they didn't die. Well, what God was saying was, you will die. You weren't going to. You were meant, I made you to live forever. I made, I made you to be without sin, without pain, without struggle. You've brought that on by wanting to be omniscient, by wanting to be uh, godlike. So now you will work, now you will toil, now you will feel pain, now you will suffer, and your life will end in death. And if you choose to not have me, you will lose eternal life. So... Uh, you've heard people say, you know, if I do this, if I do that, will God send me to hell? God sends nobody to hell. God allows us to choose not to have him, and we choose hell ourselves. That's what, that, so that's what, so God's not, he's not going to, God, wa we're his children. He wants us to choose him. But when we, through the pattern of our life, we constantly reject him, reject him, reject him, and we do not seek reconciliation with him, then we are essentially saying through our entire lives, I don't want you. I want separation from you. And that is what hell is, eternal and complete separation from, from God, from heaven. So um, because of, now we know what sin is. Sin are these things that we do, these, 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 these faults we have. We commit these things that are bad and, um, and we are, we're tarnished for it. We have to reconcile with God. But there's a sin that we don't commit. It's called original sin. It's a sin that we inherit from our parents who inherited from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve. And that's what baptism frees us from. Baptism is, is being washed clean of original sin and being, being brought into the church and being basically an adopted child of God. That's why baptism is so important. It's the most important day of our life. But even though we are forgiven of the original sin, which is as simple as, as, the, as the, the priest or deacon um, baptizing, we are still wounded by it. And that wound is called concupiscence. So concupiscence is, I think of it as like a leaning, all right? My particular type of sin that I do is this one, and your sin is that one over there. And we lean in that direction. And we're weakened when we're in the presence of those types of things. We wouldn't have that, that, that weakness if we didn't have concupiscence. Many of the saints over the centuries have been uh, grateful for their concupiscence because it's an indicator to them. I need to avoid that, which is what the saints have always said is don't try and negotiate with a sin. Don't try and work your way around a sin. Flee from it. We're too weak. We're broken. So that's part of the human experience because of the fall is we have this concupiscence. So, um, but we also have something else that we get, and I want to find it rather than try and... Uh, Genesis 3.15, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, Genesis 3.15. There's this, uh, this passage in here 
Uh, then, the, well, let me go back up a little bit to 14. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, ent- enticed my, my people here to, to sin, you shall be banned from all the animals and from all the wild creatures. On your belly shall you crawl and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put, en- now here's 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. To the woman, he said, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Yet your urge shall be for your husband, and he shall be your master. So there's a lot in that. That's, that, by the way, is called the proto-evangelium. Proto meaning the first. Evangelium means the announcement of the good news. Okay? The good news, we know, is the story of Jesus Christ, who has come to save us from our sin. We cannot save ourselves from sin. No matter how hard we try, we need a savior. That's the story of the entire thing. Remember I said it was a library? That's the whole library. We need a savior. We can't do it ourselves. And this, at the very, very beginning of Genesis, is this, is this sort of a foreshadowing, you might say, that there will be, you're going to need one to come and save you because of, of what you've done for yourself. Yes, you surely shall die because you ate of that fruit. Because, and eating of the fruit basically means because you chose against me. You chose to, to value the creation instead of the creator, which essentially is really the definition of every sin we ever commit. I know what God said, I know what God wants, I know what God mandates, and, I'm go- and I, I, I can rationalize what, what that is, and I'm still gonna do the opposite. That's what sin is, all right? So we have this notion from the very beginning of scripture, we need a, we need a savior. This savior will come to us through a woman. Okay, he's not just going to appear, it will be a, a human born of a woman. So the, people, the Jewish people have been waiting their, their entire existence for this Messiah to come. Messiah is a word that comes from the Jewish word Mashiach, which is, uh, um, the Greek word is Christos, where we get Christ, and it means the anointed one, the one who's been anointed for this purpose. So there have been lots of Mashiach lot, uh, throughout, throughout history. All, David was anointed for his purpose. For, but the one who's anointed for this purpose, and he, he comes through a woman, and it is the Son of God. That's the one we've been waiting for. And throughout all of the Old Testament, there's all these indicators of who it will be and how we will know them, uh, how we know him, and, um, uh, and what he will fulfill. So that when he does come, he is recognized. So that's... That's the proto-evangelium. That's, and that's the, the important part of what we get from that. We have a relationship with God. We blew it. He says, you're going to suffer because of that, because of what you've chosen from your free will, not because I imposed it on you. You chose it, and you're going to need a savior. The rest of the Bible, all the way up until New Testament, is essentially saying to us, it's, it's story after story of God's people of him reaching out to the people, making a covenant. Now, not, not a covenant, by the way, it, we think of it kind of like a contract, but it's really not. A contract is, I'll provide this, you provide that, and when that's done, we separate. We go our separate ways. The contract is complete. A covenant is, I give you me, you give me you. A marriage is a covenant. Um, uh, family, kinship, is a covenant. So God says, I will be your God, you will be my people. Um, in fact, the Jewish people even had, uh, uh, they, probably the only one in the ancient world that did this, they, would, they were very, uh, uh, they would commonly adopt. And when they would adopt, they would change their entire oral history to incorporate that person back to the beginning of their family. Because they said this was actually something God had ordained from the beginning, and we are now only realizing it now. But this was God's intent from the beginning. That's how much they felt about, about kinship and about covenant. So all these covenants are God's, and it always raises up. So we start from the covenant between, between uh, man and woman, Adam and Eve, and then it goes to like maybe Noah, that's the next one, which is family. Then it goes to tribe, then it goes to nation, then it goes to the entire, it gets bigger and bigger after each one of these. Every time we move through scripture, this, the covenants get bigger. And every time it's the same thing. There's an agreement made, these are the terms of the covenant, and then we break it. And God's response, because God is love, God, it's not, love is not a quality God has, it's what he is. God's response is to come back with love and to, and to reconcile with us. Until finally, we've broken it so many times, God cannot offer any covenant other than himself. 
in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, which is why there will never be a covenant after that. He cannot exceed himself through his son, Jesus Christ. So that was the, that, and covenant is also an interchangeable word with the word testament. So the New Testament is the new covenant. This is the one that will reconcile the entire world with God. So um, the creation story, as you can see, is quite fundamental to our beliefs. We have to know the importance we have uh, as being children of God. Um, I mean, um, what do we have here? Um, we also, so again, we, we uh, very often we'll see maybe other Christians we know or, 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 or things we, we see online or whatever it might be about this, this fabricated uh, um, animosity or whatever, this, 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 this struggle between, between faith and reason, between science and scripture. There is no struggle between them. That's the most important thing to know. You don't have to pick one. They both are completely reconcilable with each other as long as we know how to interpret each one of them. So one of the big ones is, well, what about evolution? You're talking about snakes and trees and apples and, and trees in the middle of the forest and, and whatever. And I'm talking about all that stuff. Well, what about evolution? Isn't that scientific? Well, it is. Now, it doesn't mean we accept the entire proposition of what the theory of evolution says, but there's clearly things that are scientifically observed and we do respect that. So when we see that species uh, do change over time to adapt to surroundings and whatever, that's, that's provable. We, 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 ha we have no problem with that. Where we have a problem is, that, is when we say that, uh, um, that all of us have descended from different, uh, and, and that we don't have a common ancestor. Well, that's, that's antithetical to scripture. We, we believe we do have a common ancestor because otherwise we would not all have that, that inherited uh, um, uh, original sin. We have that original sin because we do have common ancestors. So that's what we believe. We, we're, not, we're not accidents of nature. We were created for a purpose, and that purpose is simply because God loved us. God loved us into existence. God's word, his spoken word, is what creates things. And that's another important part of the first story. Remember, the first story of creation is on the first day of this, on the second day of that, the, the, the six days. That's the first story of creation. The second one is the garden and the snake. And that's the second, and they're, they're back to back in, 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 in scripture. So um, we, we, have to, yeah, we have to acknowledge that science does inform us. It tells us more about the creator, but it is not the same thing. We don't worship the creation. Um, I'm trying to think what else we got here. Um, also, another key thing that's in the, in the creation story, which is important, uh, that God breathed into this, it says that God breathed life into man. This is the second creation story. He breathed into man the breath of life, which is the word they use is ruach, which is a Hebrew word, which means, means breath, but it also means spirit. So that is the indicator for us that says he didn't do that for any of his other creations. He did it for us. He gave us a piece of himself, a part, part of his own divinity. We maintain as Catholics that from the very moment of conception, not birth, but the very moment of conception, we are unique individuals with that breath of life. And that's why we, we, we hold life to be so sacred, because it is a gift of God. And we have to, uh, we, we have to respect that. Um... I think what else here. Um, going through my notes and seeing if I forgot anything. Um, okay. Um, one another thing people sometimes will speak about uh, about that's kind of a struggle a struggle for a lot of people and it's not an easy answer for this one is why does evil exist? So God created this thing. Everything He created He creates out of love. And yet we live in this world where a whole lot of hate exists, where there's a lot of evil, where bad things happen to really good people. Why is that? Why? Because if we believe that God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything, he's uh, um, uh, omnipotent, he has all power, and, um, uh, and, he's, and he is everywhere, then how could such a God permit evil or, to exist? Well, the answer to that is we don't believe that God causes any evil. That is completely antithetical to God's nature, which is 
Not that he is benevolent, but he is benevolence. Not that he is powerful, but that he is power. Not that he is, that he, that, that he is loving, but that he is love. That, so he stands outside of existence itself. We can't even say, and, I, and if, I don't know if you remember this, but Father Jack touched on this in the first, in the first class, is uh, um, we can't say that God is the greatest thing because that makes God a thing. That makes him com- comparable to other things. If God is the greatest thing, then God plus this bottle of water is greater than God because I've just added this greatness to God's greatness. That's, that's a wrong way to think of it. God is outside of it. A kind of good way to think about it is the author of a book's relationship to the characters in his book. He creates the entire, it's, it's still a little off, but it's probably the best we can come up with, is he stands outside of that, he makes everything, he permits things to happen in there. Now, God gives us free will, and for the purpose of, of his uh, divine action, his divine uh, um, creative power, he does permit us to use our free will to do things that are not in our best interest or in someone else's best interest. So that's why evil exists. Evil exists because we failed and God respects us, loves us so much that he respects the free will he's given us. And it's a painful thing to have to reconcile. But also the problem is partially because we tend to think of our lives as the greatest thing. Again, that's our creation, okay? We think of our lives as the greatest thing. And if our life is taken away or our life's put in jeopardy or somehow mitigated, then we think that that is, is uh, uh, not, not pursuing the greatest thing. God himself knows, no, I have promised you more. I promised you more than life. I promised you everlasting life, which you, don't even, you can't even relate to yet because we haven't had it. So that promise still holds. If you choose me, that is still what I want to give you. And yet we always wind up sinning by saying, I choose the lesser thing. And that is a consistent theme throughout our faith. We choose the lesser thing over God. So that's a uh, not so thorough rundown of why evil exists. It's because we have free will to choose against God so that we have the ability to choose God. Does that make sense? Um, Okay, I just threw a whole lot at you there. Um, We all, now I don't want to go through the entire uh, beginning story of, of, uh, of, of Genesis here, but that's the big takeaway from the beginning 11 chapters. There's a lot of this this, myth, this this sort of a mythic type of, of genre. Um, we see like also God walks through the garden, okay? Up to, you'll see things like that up to like chapter 11. Then it becomes like a, a very historical uh, uh, documentation of, of, of how the people, uh, of how the Jewish people made it to the, to the Holy Land. It becomes a very different book. But this very um, uh, allegorical sense where there's talking animals, things like that. And it's not to, like, that's, that's the most important thing to remember. The Bible is not attempting to be a science book. It's, in te- it's attempting, and I think quite effectively and quite and wisely, telling us we have a relationship with God. We are not an accident of nature. We're here for a purpose, and we blew it. And God is trying to call us back. And He's promising from the very beginning. One will come who will, who will come to save you. Because you are, he's saying, you're, you're going to mess up again. Because you've chosen against me, you will, through your own free will, not punishment on, on my part, but by free will on yours, you will continuously dig a deeper hole until you can't climb out of that hole on your own. And that's when you're going to need you know, a savior. And that's, what, and that's what, the, uh, what, what Jesus affords us. So um, with that, I think that's probably the bulk of the story of creation, is understanding the right way to approach it. Um, we, in, our, in the 21st century, I think we are, we're very fixated on, uh, um, on accuracy in little details. Um, uh, I'm former military also. I know I have a hard time watching military movies because I'll see one thing wrong. That's it. I can't do it anymore. I can't watch it anymore because one thing's wrong. I can't believe anything else. And that's, I'm conditioned that way. I'm a I'm a, you know, 20th, 21st century guy, and, and that's how we, we look at things. Those details didn't matter. To, it didn't make them dumb. In fact, they were quite wise. They said, there's bigger things that we're concerned about. 
They didn't believe in God. They knew in God. They had a relationship with God, and that was the important thing for them. Who cared about where the rain came from, if there's holes in the sky or not? And it, now, some of you might know this. Um, I actually rewatched this the other day when I was thinking about this class. You've seen Lion King? You've, seen, you've all seen Lion King. They're lying there in the grass, and they're looking up, and it's a big, beautiful, starry night. When it was Pumbaa and Timon. And, and, uh, and Pumbaa says, Timon, you ever wonder what those big sparkly things up there in the sky? He goes, I don't wonder. I know what they are. Those, are. those are fireflies, and they're stuck on that big bluish black thing up there. And he goes, oh, okay. I always thought there were balls of burning gas billions of miles away. And he goes, oh, Pumbaa, you're an idiot. All right? And that's, it's kind of funny because we know that is, that's actually what they are, but that's not, the, that's not what's important to the people who this was written for in the beginning. They didn't care. They wanted to know, where do I come from? How am I related to God? How do I get back to God? So that's really the story of creation. And in that sense, it's entirely truth. So we, as Catholics, we have to understand that. We're not biblical literists. Literalists, I'm sorry. We do not take word for word of scripture and say that's exactly how it happened. We believe in biblical exegesis, which is what is the story that I pull from this? How does this tie into the story of salvation? We believe in unity of scripture, that the first word of the Bible is related to the last word of the Bible, and they're all tied together somehow. And that's the purpose of us understanding God through, through his scripture. So that's an important thing to remember as we go through the Bible. We don't, sometimes we do, but we really shouldn't do what, uh, I think Scott Hahn, which is the author of that book over there, he calls uh, verse slinging. Like, well, where's it saying the Bible this? Well, it's boom, boom, and he throws a verse at you. Or oh, it's that verse here. It's this chapter, that, that, that verse. That's taking something out of context. You can find a verse in the Bible to back up any belief you have. But the unity of scripture, the entire story of salvation is unchangeable. And that is not something we dictate. It's something that tells us what our relationship is with God. So.